15 years of U.S.-led intervention, nearly 40 years of conflict, yet Afghanistan seems no closer to peace. A donor conference to raise some $13 billion to fund the country through the year 2020, overshadowed in part by Monday's fresh offensive on the northern city of Kunduz. The Taliban have since been chased from the town center, but the fight's ongoing and U.S. air power has been enrolled to help flush out the insurgency. We're going to be asking our panel about the timing of the Kunduz attack days after the signing of a peace agreement with longtime warlord Gulbuddin Hekmatyar and ahead of the Brussels conference, a donor conference that's taking place as Afghanistan's embattled president has missed a deadline to hold elections and enact broad reforms that would most notably create the position of prime minister uh, for his rival and current governing party, Your Abdullah Abdullah. Ashraf Khani has to contend with trouble in Kabul and demands from his donors, most notably the return of refugees, both Europe and also neighboring Pakistan, keen to send back Afghans, even though the fighting is now worse than ever, it seems. Today in the France Venquette debate, how to save Afghanistan, joining us from Geneva, former Afghan ambassador to Canada and France, Omar Samad, now CEO of Silk Road Consulting. Nice to see you again. Thank you. From Washington, political analyst Wahed Fakiri, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And former Pakistani diplomat Musharraf Zaidi, whose column appears regularly in Pakistani daily newspaper The News. Thanks for joining us. Great pleasure. Here in the studio, we're in the company of France24.com senior editor Lila Jacinto. The France Venquet debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. One year to the day since the Taliban had overrun the center of Kunduz, the insurgency doing it again. Now, as of this Wednesday, the armed forces had retaken most of the city center. Fighting, though, still reported to the south and east on social media. The Taliban have been crowing, especially since it's forcing the president, well, to field questions about it at a donors conference in Brussels. Enemies of freedom can affect the news cycle, but they will not dent our will, diminish our resolve, or divert our focus from building the strong state, the market, and societal institutions that a free people and a sovereign country require. Wahid Fakir, your, your reaction to the, to the remarks there by the president? Uh, well, I do believe that uh, uh, Mr. Ghani uh, he knows the West very well, very well particularly the American. Uh, they, he knows the American mentality, and he says always the right things uh, because he knows the audience. Uh, but uh, uh, his actions, almost a year and a half now, it seems like he hasn't done anything. He hasn't fulfilled his promise. He promised everything, but uh, we haven't seen anything uh, accomplished yet. I haven't seen anything accomplished yet. Uh, uh, what should he have accomplished by now that he hasn't? Uh, uh, particularly the uh, uh, um, uh, corruption. Corruption was a major issue that he hasn't uh, tackled yet. Even uh, corruption has expanded, expanded uh, within his family, within his uh, um, uh, cabinet, and uh, throughout Afghanistan. As uh, you have, uh, uh, you would know that that uh, many. Uh, institute has labeled Afghanistan the most corrupt uh, country in the, in the world. Uh, security, as you just mentioned, uh, the, in the north, in the so south, in the east, security has been worsened. Uh, and and uh, uh, many other issues, uh, reforms in the government, reform in the uh, election commissions, all these issues that he brought, that he promised, he did not deliver. Uh, Omar Samad, uh, roll back the clock a couple of years, replace the name Ashraf Ghani by Hamid Karzai, and you have, well, all the same accusations, corruption, inability to tackle the Taliban without major help from the West. What can an Afghan president do? Well, I, I think that an Afghan president, an Afghan leader, and the leadership as a whole, and I would even include the political elite in the country, uh, who have influence at diff varying degrees uh, need to uh, prioritize what is important for the country. Uh, security, obviously, 
comes on top. Uh, good governance, which includes fighting corruption, is, in my opinion, uh, very close to security and making sure that the Afghan people are protected and that the Afghan people are not hurt either by the Taliban uh, and armed factions that fight the government and the Afghan people, but also by those who uh, take advantage of the system, which has been inherited from the previous government of Hamid Karzai, which, as you mentioned, was highly corrupt and has to be fixed and has not really been fixed. But having said this, I have to also say that this unity government which came about uh, as part of a very difficult, as a result of a very difficult election, has tried to say the right things and has done a few, has taken some measures, but the measures are not enough and sufficient. And I think the international community today in Brussels expects more, but more importantly, the Afghan people expect more. All right. Last week, uh, uh, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan's president did do something. He signed a peace deal with the former prime minister turned warlord Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, whose star power has waxed and waned over the years, but has been fighting uh, ever since before, well, before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979. With this agreement, I hope that we can put an end to the crisis in our country and that stability will return. Leo Jacinto, this brings us to the timing of the latest attack on Kunduz. I ask because uh, uh, Hekmatyar is from, is, Kund is from Kunduz. Is there a causality? There is. There is. And when uh, Ashraf Ghani talked about the new cycle, you know, the, the irony of the juxtapositions is, is, is incredible. You know, Kunduz, once again, is the same thing is happening as it happened a year ago. Uh, you know, the Taliban getting very close to a very critical city, uh, city, you know. I mean, the most important thing about Kunduz that we should stress is that it's the gateway to Central Asia. So you have all the Central Asian states oil-rich states watching this very carefully. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, so there's that juxtaposition. There's also the juxtaposition of people fleeing Kunduz, fleeing borders, while the EU is, is you know, is making a deal uh, with... To send back refugees. We'll be talking, we'll be talking about that point later. But uh, striking a deal with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar... How big, how big is that? For, explain it for people who don't know Afghanistan. Honestly, it's not that big. <laughs> uh, Gulbuddin is, is right now one of many warlords. He's not that significant. You know, the fact that the Taliban are making an assault on his birth city is, is actually a show of what kind of strength he has. Um, the, the Taliban, uh, you know, these peace talks, the negotiations have been continuing, but nobody from the main Taliban or the Quetta, Shura, as we call them, has ever sat at the table. You know, from the point of view of the message this gives Afghans, Afghans are incredibly forgiving. You know, after 40 years of former commanders turned politicians, they can be very forgiving, but Hekmatya yeah, has a particularly bloody record. His human rights record is gruesome, even by Afghan standards, and it's not even granting the security that anybody's hoping for by talking and making deals with this guy. All right, let me ask you, uh, Musharraf Za Zaidi, uh, because uh, we, what do you do with someone like uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar? Do you sign a deal or not? Well, I think that uh, I, unlike uh, the other uh, guests on the show, I, I have a, I continue to have a great degree of admiration for what President Ashraf Ghani has tried to do in partnership with the uh, Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah. Um, this is not an ordinary context within which Afghan leadership is trying to uh, string together a series of wins uh, long enough that the onslaught of the expectations of countries in the region, particularly Pakistan and Iran, but also countries abroad that are going to underwrite the future of Afghanistan as they have today. They've committed $15.2 billion uh, once again. Uh, these expectations uh, are a huge burden. And, and part of the uh, trick of uh, governing Afghanistan successfully is going to be bringing people into the tent uh, the previous speaker mentioned, you know, the brutal or bloody history that Hekmat Yad has, uh, without question, uh, a, a warlord in a in a war context will have a bloody history. Rashid Dostum, who is a who is a major uh, partner in the current government, 
uh, probably has the bloodiest history uh, of, of all the sort of warlords. Uh, there are warlords that, you know, the West has, uh, after uh, the fall of uh, Kabul, uh, after after 9-11, uh, that the West has uh, has uh, created a caricature of. Ahmed Shah Massoud is a good warlord, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar is a bad one, Rashid Dostum is a good one when he plays ball and isn't a good one when he doesn't. Hamid Karzai is a great Afghan leader unless he starts criticizing, you know, Peter Galbraith. Uh, you know, I think there's a... I think the way in which we speak about Afghanistan has been one of the problems, and, and notwithstanding the complexities of the region, and I, I suspect we will get down to that, which is why you would have somebody on from Pakistan, but, but I think we need to talk about Afghanistan in a context of solving a problem, and the problem is that there isn't peace in Afghanistan, and so as many as humanly possible folks that will come into the tent and agree to stop killing people and instead sit down around a table and start governing the country, the be the more we do that, the better it is. And so I think it's a positive thing that Hekmat Yad is in the tent and we have to watch carefully and try to support the unity government in helping it get other folks, including the members of the Quetta Shura, into the tent. Wahid Fakiri, you agree? If I may, if you have, if you have a minute. I, I... I, I, I do agree that it is better for the Hikmat Yar to be in the tent. It is better to have peace in Afghanistan. But bringing Hikmat Yar will not resolve Afghanistan problem. Afghanistan problem is much deeper. Uh, it is a problem of a, a go government that cannot stand on its own, a government after 15 years of international support but still cannot hold major cities, uh, a government that is divided uh, in itself, a government that cannot function. So it, it's not, uh, I do uh, uh, support uh, the, the peace process, the peace process toward the Taliban or toward Gulbani um, Hikmatyar, uh, but I think I think that's, uh, that's one part of the issue. The most important part of the issue is the corruption itself, the good governance, the issue of the good governance that sh uh, should have come to after 15 years, the promise that the United States and the international community did to, Afga to, to the Afghan peoples, the expectation that they have raised. We have not, the Afghan people have not received that kind of uh, treatment. What the Afghan people receive from the international community is a bunch of warlords, uh, uh, mostly run, uh, uh, running uh, uh, drug mafias supported by the U.S., as the, as the previous uh, speaker said. So what do you do if then? You just, you, uh, so what should the donors do? Not give money? I think that the donors have, uh, uh, particularly, uh, yes, yes, some, there has to be some uh, receptacle uh, actions, you know, if you get money, you have to do this and that, that. But that's usually said, but never been implemented and never been actually uh, implemented in Afghanistan. We always say, okay, corruption has to be uh, uh, eliminated. Everyone say, yes, this is a good idea, but it, it's never implemented in Afghanistan. And that's the big issue, right. I think, the corruption the governance, the bad governance that the, the current government uh, has. Omar Samad, your thoughts? Well, uh, nobody says that Afghanistan is an easy case. 40 years of war, destruction, uh, you know, uh, ev everything from institutions to capacity. Uh, for the past 15 years, the international community after 9-11 has tried to put this country back together. Uh, all sides have made mistakes. Uh, we have to learn from those mistakes. Uh, yes, Golbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, it's good to make peace with anyone who's fighting. The problem with Hekmatyar is that until just a few weeks ago, maybe two, three months ago, he was constantly changing sides either between Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and he was still uh, basically encouraging people to fight against the government. So there has to be caution with Hekmatyar. Maybe militarily he's weak, which he is, but the question is, what is his political motivation? Will he play a positive role under the tent? Or will he blow up the tent? So that is the question with Ekmat Yar. The same will happen with the Taliban. Are they coming into the tent or they're not coming into the tent? And for what reason are they coming into the tent? Now, we know that countries around us are, have played a meddling role for the past not only 15, but 20, 30 years, sometimes positively, sometimes not so positively. The Afghans are worried about how their neighbors are treating the Afghan issue. You know, we see proxy warfare in Afghanistan. We see groups that have ties and linkages to 
to uh, uh, state-sponsored uh, uh, institutions outside of Afghanistan. This has to end as well. So it's not a question of how much money you put into Afghanistan. A lot of money has gone, gone into Afghanistan. It's also a, a question of accountability and aid effectiveness and aid conditionality, as was mentioned. We have to have condi conditionality on aid and money coming into Afghanistan. Otherwise, we'll repeat the same mistakes again. Uh, we're going to hear from John Kerry uh, now. Uh, the, in Brussels, he made a pitch for peace, offering what sounds a lot like um, uh, a real push to take talks with the Taliban to the next level. A political settlement negotiated with the Afghan government is the only way to end the fighting, ensure lasting stability, and achieve a full drawdown, ultimately, of international military forces, which is their goal. All right, I, I, I bring in John Kerry, Lili Jacinto, on, on the back of what was just said there by Omar Samad, mm. because Kerry pointedly said as well, that it's not just about the Afghans, the Afghans and the Taliban. He says we need for this peace process to work, to bring on board, and he mentioned them by name, Russia, um, uh, India, Pakistan, Iran, China, uh, to get these countries uh, on board and helping in the process. Well, I think, you know, what we are seeing right now in Brussels is, is, is the classic, uh, you know, the fate of Afghanistan, which is being played by regional powers and by superpowers. Uh, but, you know, this all this talk, I like this tent analogy a lot. You know, we're always with the tent. Uh, you know, the big tent, an Afghan tent is very exclusive, um, inclusive. But, you know, Ashraf Ghani has not been very good at, his, at the big tent uh, policy, you know, and it's very easy for us to say now that Karzai is out, that in fact Karzai was a more adept politician. You know, when I go to Afghanistan, I hear across the board uh, deep rumblings of complaint because Ghani is not seen as being able to play the Afghan political game, which is talk to everybody. You know, he's, he's seen as uh, very much a bureaucrat. He knows how to talk to the West, but he doesn't really know the Afghan way of doing business. So even, you know, even internally, there are some pretty big players that are not happy with, with Ghani, including in his so-called unity government, which is a disunity government. Really. All right, so how much of it plays out internally? How much of it plays out regionally? We'll be asking our panel when we come back in the France 24 debate.